direction and then it just disappears when runners are in scoring position so yes sir there she Hello and welcome to episode 198 of section 138. I'm your host, Mark Colley, as always, joined by Bryson Poza. Unfortunately, Jacob not with us today. He'll be back on Wednesday, Thursday when we record after the Yankee series. But first, a disappointing series in Cleveland. The Blue Jays lose three of four against a team they probably should have taken three of four from. The offense still nowhere to be found. Starting pitching, starting to falter a little bit. Bullpen making some mistakes. Bryson, where is your head at right now? You know, I think you said it best. This is a series where you come into it, you're expecting three out of four, hopefully. Maybe best case scenario, you're also expecting a sweep. But uh, that wasn't the case. The Jays pretty much came into Cleveland here and they were not playing good. Um, there was a lot of ups and downs. There was one game in particular that went really well, of course, the game they won. But overall, it was just too streaky. It was up and down. And um, they found or there were just a couple frustrating losses here that they ended up losing to. So it's just it's disappointing because you had an opportunity this weekend to get at the Guardians who are 500, you know, a team hovering around 500. And you can take care of them before the Yankees series next week. But uh, they found themselves on the opposite end. And at the end of the day, they do lose three or four. Definitely a frustrating series overall, though. Oh, yeah. Frustrating. I don't think even begins to capture it. Um, just watching the offense roll through that series and against pitchers that they should have been able to attack. Um, you know, maybe not a guy like Shane Bieber, but um, all the other guys, they should have been able to do something against them. One guy making his first major league start. Another guy entering this series with an ERA above 10.0. They should have been able to do something against that. Um, I think the big thing to talk about, and I guess we can start here, is the return of Teoscar Hernandez. We talked about this last time about how it wouldn't be a magic pill for the offense. And I think this series, if anything, proves that it isn't. The offense still not totally where they want to be. Um, obviously, today in um, – the Sunday game losing 4-3 and in the second game where Teoscar Hernandez played in the second game of the doubleheader losing 8-2 to um, just nowhere near where the Blue Jays want to be offensively and Teoscar didn't really fix that of course he drove in two of the Blue Jays three runs in Sunday's game but still not being able to deepen the lineup not being able to force the same type of offensive production we want to see from this lineup which continues to be terrible with runners in scoring position and just not good enough overall um of course only scoring i guess if you include the eight to three win in the first game on saturday which was the biggest offensive production since opening day they have a fair number of runs in this series but most of that coming in one game alone so obviously not ideal numbers from this week and teoscar hernandez not totally panning out yet for the blue jays offense not yet. I mean, at least on paper, you can see how much or deep, how much deeper this lineup truly is. And I think we finally did see that when he did come back, you know, Ty Oscar Hernandez, we were kind of expecting he'd be back at the uh, game one of this series. And that just wasn't the case. We found out later that he needed an extra day in Dunedin to get his body right. He said he was a little bit sore. And of course, he made the trip on Friday, but Friday resulted in the rain out. And then on Saturday, they really can only get him in. They couldn't get him in the game until game two because they didn't want to throw him right back in 18 innings right away because of somebody who was just coming back from an injury. So you had to, it wasn't ideal, but you had to deal with two games without Teoscar Hernandez in the lineup. And like you were mentioning, the runners in scoring position, even when he was in the lineup in the back half of the series, it just wasn't there overall. I mean, if you go back to game one, I think it was one for 10 with runners in scoring position. And this was a game where the Jays got ahead early. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. hits home run number seven. And then after that, it just fell apart for them, uh, for the Blue Jays. It was just, it wasn't a sharp start from Jose Barrios. You allow six un unanswered runs as a team. And that's pretty much what happened with that. And there were so many opportunities where the Jays could have got into that. And then in game two, which was game one of uh, Saturday's doubleheader, it was actually the only game where the Jays really capitalized, I thought, with runners in scoring position. They went four for 10 with that. Uh, Rymel Tapia was the leader with that, a couple singles. George Spring was also a key factor in that game. So it was kind of interesting because, and there's lots of jokes on the telecast about how the Jays were up by, I think it was about five runs, going into the ninth inning and saying, you know, they haven't really been here before. How are you going to handle it like that? And they managed to do that. They managed to get away with that. And I think after we saw that, 
you kind of had the impression that, you know, we were talking about it last episode, where's the signs that they're going to turn the corner? Well, you figured if you're at, you know, that point of the day on Saturday, you're feeling pretty good heading into the second game of the doubleheader. And before I get to the second game, backed by a very good performance by Kevin Gosman, who starts off May right where he left off in April. Um, You know, unfortunately he walked his first batter of the season, something that we knew was not going to be sustainable all year. So it finally happened. And his splitter, once again, was pretty much the leading force. So it was a really quality start from him. And when Kevin Gosman pitching, you know you have a really good chance to win. So, again, good momentum heading into game three. This is the game where Teoscar Hernandez finally returns. Not ideal from what happened. You went from pretty much hitting the ball really well about 30 minutes prior, and then you go really cold for the next three hours after that. So that's where I kind of stand on it. And that's pretty much where the, the game did stand on that, uh, on that. And, of course, Teoscar Hernandez, who came back, you know, It was a windy day in Cleveland. Um, You go to the first inning of that game. He kind of had a little bit of a misplay in the outfield, but of course you can definitely throw in the wind as a factor on that one. But that really was one of the reasons for Cleveland breaking out the way they did in the first inning. It was a three run first inning. And then of course that also affected Ross Stripling's final pitching line, because I don't think Ross Stripling's pitching line really truly reflected on how he pitched, because I thought after the first inning, he was fine and he was, you got everything you could out of Ross Stripling. So Rough first inning on that one. You fell behind there, and then it just got worse from there. And then that's pretty much what happened on that. You lose game three. And then game four, you were talking about, this was the game where Teos Hernandez was responsible for the runners pretty much only today. You cash it in early on in the game. Maybe you're feeling like this is going to be a pretty good afternoon. Wasn't the case again. We were going back to the games that we've been seeing all year this year where it's been one run games. It's been close. It's been close. The Jays lost the lead in the middle innings. They retook the lead in the seventh. And then in the eighth, you fall behind a couple runs. And then you just feel like when Cleveland took the lead in the eighth inning, it just wasn't feeling good. You weren't feeling good heading into the ninth. And then it was also a start where Alec Manoa was just not as sharp. And I think that also was a little bit strange, but he was working through a lot of issues. He managed to get the five innings at the end of the day. You couldn't capitalize on the runners or the runners that score in position, the opportunities that you had. And that's pretty much what I think you take away from the series is that although you thought we were maybe seeing signs of this earlier on in the series, it just felt like once you saw it, you revert back to what it's been all year, even with Teoscar Hernandez in the lineup. It's just frustrating. And you knew that Teoscar Hernandez wasn't going to be the savior of the lineup. Of course, he's going to help in the lineup. And of course, he did help being responsible for the runners on the Sunday game. And of course, on paper, how the lineup is fairly deep. But at the end of the day, it's just still an issue. The team still last in terms of batting average with runners in scoring position. And before I hand it back over to you, I think it's really interesting because you see here, as much as the Cleveland Guardians are 500, we know there's not a lot of expectations for them this year. We know that they don't have a lot of guys, but they're the best team in baseball right now with runners in scoring position. So as much as you're seeing the Jays struggle through this, you're also looking on the other side of the diamond and you're seeing a team like the guardians finding ways, no matter what of cashing in runs. And I think that was the most frustrating thing is that all the opportunities that you gave them, and it may have just been little opportunities, they capitalized on everything. And that was the clear difference maker this weekend. Yeah, and by comparison, the Blue Jays didn't capitalize on most of their opportunities. I mean, you look at every single game, except for the one that the Blue Jays won and scored eight runs in. Every other game, they scored a run in the first inning. Most games, it was two runs. In the in one of the game, it was only one run. But you look at that and the fact that they weren't able to build off that. They got to the pitchers in the first inning or in the case of the game that they actually won, the second inning. And in every game, except for the first game of the Saturday doubleheader, they weren't able to build off that. And that's what's so frustrating. You saw them have the ability to do it. You see them have success when runners aren't in scoring position, and then it just disappears when runners are in scoring position. So, yeah, it's incredibly frustrating to watch. And I guess the question now becomes – are you concerned? Are you worried? They just lost a series to, you mentioned Cleveland, maybe not as bad as some people think, or at least they haven't been playing bad. They just split a series with the Padres before they faced the Blue Jays. Is there still reason to be worried about this? I mean, it's frustrating watching this team day in and day out, no offense and keeping counting down the days until the offense gets going and having Teoscar come back and that not being a fix, but is there concern more than just frustration? 
I think that the week ahead for this team definitely makes you, I would, you know, concerned, worried, a little bit paranoid. There's, I think there's a lot of words you can use, but, you know, we sound like broken records here. And I think pretty much everyone talking about this team does is that we know that they're just too good to be like this all year. But again, they show signs, they revert back to it. So I don't know if I, I don't know if I use the word worried, but of course, frustrated is definitely the leading candidate on this frustrated, paranoid, you know, just anxious. I think those are the words I would probably use instead. And going back to what I said right off the top, you're heading into a week this, this week in particular, where this is one of the hardest parts of the month for you. You and you have obviously the New York Yankees for two games. We know that the Yankees are still hot. Um, they're playing to the Texas Rangers this weekend and they have the series extended into Tuesday due to rain. So they're going to be playing tomorrow still as much as the, uh, the Jays have a day off, but you're coming off a series loss to them. You know that the Jays are probably going to want to get back at them, but at the end of the day, you still, it's still, things are still kind of status quo in terms of the state of both teams as the Yankees are still playing well. And then on top of that, you have the Tampa Bay Rays who I think have won six in a row and they have caught fire. You have them next weekend and it's in Tropicana field. It's in Tampa. I'm just, I don't like, Right now on paper, you just don't like it. You don't like it. Of course, things can change. Of course, things may change. Of course, the Jays could definitely, you know, come out of nowhere and win these two series is coming up. But right now, you just look at it and you you scratch your head a bit and you wonder if it's going to be a long week ahead. And at the end of the day, too, you know, I think the Jays are third now in the AL East. So they fall behind the Rays and they're already behind the Yankees. I know it's May. I know it's still early. You just you don't want to fall behind too much. I just think it's a competitive division and it's something that you have to stay in reach of. It's an important week for them ahead. You have a chance to get back at the Yankees who took two uh, two out of three from you last week. And then you have the red hot race too now. So the timing's not ideal. You just, you know, you hope coming out of this weekend, we would be on the opposite end of this. Maybe it happens this week. I don't know, but at the end of the day, anxious, paranoid, um, and there was one more word I used that I said earlier. I think those were the words I would use because I know, and I think everyone knows that they're going to be much better than this, but it's just not there right now. And that's the truth. But of course, I think the one thing that you do like, and pretty much what we harped on earlier on is that you still have, or you have now Teoscar Hernandez this week in particular, it's going to look a lot better on paper with the lineup. And I think you have to be, you know, feel a little bit better as much as, again, you don't want to rely on him being that only kind of solution piece to this you have to be very careful with that so it helps that he's there and you got to hope for the best this week and i do think the jays they definitely have a chance to be competitive this week but again it's going to be tough with the amount of runs they're putting up and it's just been the same story is that the pitching and the bullpen has been carrying the success you see it and you kind of have been seeing a little bit of hiccups the past couple of days but i just think the fact that they're not putting up uh, the amount of runs that they should be is making this very noticeable as much as the pitchers overall have still been really good because it's not like they've been absolutely terrible, you know, a couple hiccups here and there, but unfortunately due to the protection or the lack of protection they have from the offense, it's very easy to kind of look or look now and say, Hey, this isn't what they were looking like in April. There's a couple hiccups here. You saw today, Tim Mesa in particular on the Sunday, been most, one of the most reliable pretty much pieces in the, the Blue Jays bullpen. I think it was his first hit he allowed with his slider. I think that was the kind of the key piece of that game tying home run that they gave up in the eighth inning. It happens today. And then you, you just notice it and you, you, you hate to blame the bullpen because it really isn't their fault. It really is not as much as, you know, the margin fair has been small all year. You just, it's very noticeable to see how the pitching has been carrying the team. And now that, it hasn't been as smooth as it has been the last couple of weeks. It's very easy to see that they're not exactly capitalizing like they were the week before, but at the end of the day, they've still been really good. So that's the part where I, where I think I'm at. Uh, how about you? I mean, of course, I know you're going to have lots to say on this one too, but I don't know. I just, I hate to use the word worried right now. I, I don't, I still will not say that word right now. Well, it sounds like you're, a, you're nervous. Like, like nervous you is a good are word. already would, looking at the standings. Nervous. Yeah, I would say nervous. I'm not even, I don't have the standings in mind right now. For me, standings don't become a conversation until probably July, maybe June, if we're being generous. I'm not even thinking about that right now. So for that reason, I don't know if, I don't even think I'm nervous. Like, I think in my mind, I know the Blue Jays are going to come around. I know the offense is going to be here eventually, sooner or later. Um, 
so I'm not nervous, but frustrated is the word that I have to hammer home time and time again, because watching these games will be the death of me. Watching this lineup come out day in and day out and score two, three runs when it was supposed to be the best lineup in baseball, that'll be the death of me. Frustration is where not nervousness because I'm not nervous about what this team is doing. And you bring up the bullpen. That's what I wanted to ask about next because we're starting to see signs, depending how you paint the picture, we're starting to see signs of weakness out of the bullpen. We're starting to see someone like you mentioned, Adam Simber give up a pair of runs, or excuse me, Tim Meza give up a run, the tying run in today's game, and then Adam Simber coming in and giving up a run as well. We're starting to see cracks in that facade of the Blue Jays' dominance out of the bullpen that we saw in the month of April. This might be the beginning of a pattern that we saw take shape in the 2021 season when the Blue Jays' bullpen was phenomenal for the month of April and then kind of fell apart in the month of May. It seems like you're pretty confident that that's not happening in this case, and it's really only that, that we're seeing these cracks and these failures out of the bullpen because it's every single game is close because the offense isn't showing up. Is that a correct determination of how you're feeling about the bullpen? That I'm not too worried about it? Yeah, because that's how it came across when you first Yeah, I, I think, yeah, like if it continues, obviously you're going to continue to pay attention to it. But right now, yeah, I wouldn't say – that right now i just think that of course you know the workload is definitely clearly in a way in a small way probably catching up a bit but it's not to the point where they're burnt out or anything like that like i think jordan romano he had a lot of time off this series in particular which was good because a lot of people were pretty much pointing out of the heavy workload that he's had but i just think that maybe you're like i think what you said was pretty good about their small cracks but i think it's something that can be worked through and I'm also trying to say and I think it's very obvious is that they also need help you know when you have a margin of five runs it's okay to allow a run or two here and there but when it's one run every game then you gotta you gotta be perfect and that's the truth and you can't you can't give up or blow leads like you did today and that's what happened today is that and the problem is is that when it does happen right now we're at a state where we don't feel confident whatsoever that the Jays can have a ninth inning rally. So it's all going to correct itself. And then of course the bullpen is going to be a lot better, but yeah, right now I wouldn't say they're burnt. I would just say that maybe the workload's catching up to them, or maybe it's just a, um, a current f- uh, funk they're in. I don't know. We'll see. I'm right there with you. I'm not concerned and not even frustrated like I am with the offense. I think it, it really is an offensive problem that is causing bullpen problems. The bullpen is not going to be a problem. We're not going to be sitting here talking about the bullpen giving up two runs if the Blue Jays are scoring six runs because then the Blue Jays are winning. It's only the fact that the Blue Jays are scoring three runs that we're talking about the bullpen giving up two runs because it ended up costing them the game. But in reality, it's the fact that the Blue Jays only had one hit after the first inning that cost them the game. And that's what really matters in this situation. So yeah, I'm not really concerned or thinking about the bullpen at all. I think, you know, brought it up last episode, but when you're playing all these one run games, the tiny mistakes are amplified so, so much. And we saw that out of the bullpen. When you make one mistake, one slider that hangs up a little bit and the guy hits it for a home run, that's the tie game in a one run game. Instead of it being a six run game, five run game, four run game, where the Blue Jays offense is tallying up the runs and one home run given up by Tim Meza doesn't matter. The bullpen doesn't have to be perfect. So yeah, I think it's, I guess the shape of the trajectory of the Blue Jays bullpen right now, given that it's so far mapping out identical to the 2021 season, maybe a little bit of a reason to be concerned but I don't think that it is in reality actually mapping that pattern. I think the Blue Jays are just fine bullpen wise. And once the offense figures itself out, we're not going to be talking about the bullpen at all. The best defense is a good offense. The best offense is a good defense. And I think once the Blue Jays get their, their offense going, we're not talking about the bullpen failures at all. Um, I mentioned that the small things are overblown when you're playing one run games and we did see some other sloppiness. You mentioned the Teoscar Hernandez play in right field. It was windy in Cleveland. Frustration is a word I would use watching that play. 
maybe not Teo's fault, but it was windy in Cleveland, and it was frustrating to watch that unfold. Um, what was the Blue Jays' fault was their performance on the base paths. We, we saw Vladdy get thrown out on the base paths. We saw Santiago Espinal get thrown out on the base paths, and we also saw George Springer get thrown out on the base paths. And like I said, if the offense was clicking, we wouldn't be talking about these things. But the fact that the Blue Jays are only scoring two, three, four runs a game and everything has to go perfectly for them to win, and then you have three guys getting thrown out on the base pass in one game, that, that is a rough look for the Blue Jays. Especially when that has something to do with runners in scoring position or anything like that. It's just can't, a trickle down can't have a runner in You can't have a runner in scoring position if you get thrown out on the base exactly and that's the problem it's actually is that... it's actually a plan by the blue jays to get the offense going so these guys are hitting without runners in scoring position because they can do that when nobody's <laughs> on base but then we're someone's exactly. on base they just i don't know it's approach it's pretty much everything it just completely goes the other way but yeah no it's sloppy i mean you hope that it was just kind of a weekend thing and they can get over this it's been a lot worse before where we've spoken about this multiple times like you know, you, you look back at 2020, there was a lot of issues there. 2021, there was a few issues here and there too. So it seems like it's just something that maybe happens throughout the year. I don't know uh, what it is, but of course they got to clean it up. And I think they know that, but, and of course the team desperate for runs, you need those base runners. And it's f- fairly obvious that that's the, ca- or that's the case. So you didn't like it. And I think the fact that as frustrating as this series was, the fact that people were getting picked off the way they were, made it even worse like it was already at a boiling point and then you see that and you want to get even more mad and then of course it all falls apart and that's pretty much what was going on this weekend so yeah i mean it's definitely noticeable i don't know I don't, maybe i don't know if you're concerned about it moving forward it's kind of hard to say with these types of things because you feel like this is something where they can correct it hopefully fast because again you have important games coming up this week against divisional opponents and you want to make sure that, you know, in, in games like these ones and close games, you know, another kind of bridge to the margin of error being small, you got to be perfect on the bases or you don't have to be perfect necessarily, but you can't be getting sloppy like you were. You have to be playing properly. You have to be running. And there's only so much you can do, but you can't be big, getting picked off at first base, third base like that. So that's where I stand on it. The defensive plays, yes. It was fairly windy in Cleveland. Um, It's kind of just overall this weekend, it was windy. And it's kind of funny because last year when the Jays were in Cleveland, it was also really windy. So I don't know what it is, but that's two straight years where it's been windy in Cleveland. And that's pretty much what happened with the Teoscar Hernandez play. And then you saw it kind of with the other outfielders and uh, even on Cleveland side, even though they were making plays, you can see them struggling. You can see them kind of running all over the place. You can see the ball going everywhere. So you know, you don't want to give a pass completely on it, but it's definitely a main factor to why the play unfolded the way it did. So that's where it happens on that. And as much as you can't control the wind, you can definitely control how you're going to handle the bases, how you're going to handle just, I guess, base running aggressiveness. And that's something that they can definitely clean up throughout the week. And I hope, hope they do. Yeah. And I think if we're looking for a reason why the Blue Jays had three guys thrown out on the base pass, you can probably chalk it up to desperation when you're trying to do anything to score runs and you know the guy at the plate probably isn't going to be able to do anything. I think it's fair to say that the runner is getting a little bit desperate looking to get even that extra foot in the case a rare hit comes with a runner on base. Um, Hopefully in a week's time, we're not talking about a position where the Blue Jays are desperate on the base pass but that's a reality we are living with right now. Um, I want to talk about Alec Manoa because he had some interesting quotes after today's game. Um, He took issue with the baseballs that were being used. um, And he said that they were essentially not sticky at all. And we know that baseballs, there is this magic mud from, the banks of the Delaware River in New Jersey, I think it is, that they take this mud and every single baseball used in Major League Baseball is rubbed up with this before it's used by a pitcher to give it a special tack, give it more of a grip because, you know, anyone who's played baseball knows that a brand new baseball has a shine to it, has a little bit of slipperiness to it. 
And basically what Alec Manoa said was, first off, there was no consistency in the way these balls were rubbed up. Second off, there was no consistency in the seam height for these baseballs. He said some had really distinct high seams. He said other baseballs had very small, fluffy seams, I think was the word he used. So just total inconsistency is what he was saying. Um, Bottom line, he said it wasn't an excuse for his performance. And I mean, no one's coming out here and criticizing his performance. He gave up two runs in five innings. Alec Minot is a phenomenal pitcher. So that's a little bit less than you would expect from him, but it's still a strong start. Um, I just thought it was interesting to see that, especially all the talking that we've done this season and things that we've heard this season about the baseballs and about them being um, obviously favored in the hands of pitchers. Manoa saying something a little bit different here, but I thought it was interesting to hear that kind of different side of the conversation. Something we haven't really heard about. We've heard about the depreciated offensive staff stats, that sort of thing, but we haven't heard about um, inconsistencies on the pitcher side and inconsistencies with the baseball. Yeah. And I think it just adds on to the whole, I mean, the theories this year, like you said, the offense is down, everything like that, but yeah, this was kind of a new element. And when he says it, you can kind of see him in terms of his performance today. Perhaps he backed up those claims. I mean, I kind of said it earlier on when we were talking about the series a little bit, he wasn't sharp. And I think that was kind of pretty odd. And that was kind of noticeable through everybody. And that was kind of the lone starts that he's ever had where his stuff wasn't there. We haven't seen that a lot from Alec Manoa. He was battling through five innings and he got to five innings, which was good. And, you know, he just wasn't striking out a lot of people. His slider wasn't getting a ton of swings and misses like it usually does. And there was even one play, it might have been in the first inning, where he completely airmailed a pitch uh, to the backstop. And you've never seen that before from Alec Manoa. So I think when he does talk about this, it's hard not to believe him. And, and you know, adding on to this year of how just the baseballs in particular, if they're different, you know, as much as they've been benefiting the pitchers, there's been a few who have been noticing it as well a little bit, maybe not to the extent or giving the, the full detail that Manoa did today, but it's definitely noticeable around the game. The offensive numbers are down. So there's a lot of kind of factors happening here, but it is interesting. And I think that you got to kind of acknowledge that and recognize that maybe he is right. And of course you don't want to use that as, as an excuse, because of course there was a couple of mistakes that he made that he probably wanted to have back or pitches he could have had back that he probably would have attacked or approached differently. And that's the case on that. It just for him to complain about this in one of his only starts where we've seen Alec Manoa not be sharp. I think it's definitely important to kind of realize that it's not like he's complaining or we've seen him complain prior. You know, this is kind of something that has been brand new from him uh, overall. So that's why I definitely found it interesting. So whatever it was, um, you know, you hope it's a one-off for Manoa and I'm sure it will be. And he's going to get back to what he was prior to this started. Just, this was something where we, we didn't, we haven't seen a lot of adversity from Manoa on the mound where he's been in trouble like this, or I wouldn't say necessarily trouble. I would just say maybe battling his stuff, his A stuff. And that's what happened today. He was working around that stuff. His command was at times a little off, but of course that, you know, he was working through movement. He was getting at the end of the day, he was getting outs and he was, he pushed himself to five innings, which was really good. But you know, the fact that baseballs this year in particular have been off, they've been just different compared to previous years. You got to take, you got to kind of acknowledge that and believe him. And I'm sure there's going to be other stories throughout the year where we see similar things. We're only in May and we've heard about it all through April. We heard about it today from Manoa. You're probably going to hear about it through other pitches for the rest of May. You're going to hear it throughout the summer. This is something that it's going to be well known, I think this year, but it's just, yeah, I mean, I, I found it pretty interesting when he did say that he seemed frustrated. He just seemed that he couldn't exactly get a grip on what was going on because you were talking about the difference in seams and whatnot. So I don't know. I mean, it's just, you, you wonder what these conspiracy theories with the baseballs and you got to, and Manoa is definitely, you know, I believe him hundred percent on this one, but it's just, it was odd today seeing how, he was kind of battling a little bit today with that. You just don't see it from a pitcher like him. So that's why I do think, you know, noticing what he said and kind of acknowledging what he said is pretty important uh, to kind of have some sort of, you know, reason or, you know, a little small reason behind a start today. Yeah. I 100% believe him. I don't think it's a question of that. I think it's just a question of what this means, broader scale. And I don't know if there is more to read into it. Like the conspiracy theorist part of me, wants to say that like this is the first step of something bigger like MLB 
screwed up in the first month of the season in changing the baseball too much that it shut down all offenses. So now they're going the other way and fiddling with things and making it so that pitchers are having a tough time. That's what the conspiracy part of me wants to say. But to be honest, I think it might just be a bad batch of baseballs. Like, I don't know what MLB's process is for quality control, essentially, before baseballs get taken from the bat boy to the home plate umpire and from the home plate umpire thrown it out to the pitcher. But, but I feel like the most realistic scenario in this is that there was just a bad batch that made it through that the person rubbing him up didn't do a good enough job or they got a bad shipment from the Rawlings factory that screwed up the seams. I don't know. I don't know baseballs. I don't make baseballs, but if I had to guess, I think it's just inconsistency, but yes, I believe Manoa entirely. Like you could see it in his pitches. He was visibly frustrated on the mound on multiple occasions, which, I mean, we know he's a very energetic guy. He's a very passionate guy. He doesn't hide his emotions, but I was surprised to see that. It seemed like at one point, I it may have been the first inning, he seemed like he was yelling at himself, essentially. And I, I guess now that we know he was yelling more at the baseball than himself and frustrated with the league for that. But yeah, I think if I had to posit a guess for what the actual cause of this is, I think it's just probably just inconsistencies. Yeah, I mean, it's just I don't know. You 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 know the stories this year. You know how people are reading things into yeah. it. Maybe there's numbers to back it up. But yeah, I mean, def- it, either way, I think it was a bad batch of uh, baseballs. And um, hopefully, those are never seen again. I mean, they're obviously all you know. You know all the balls that baseball goes through, or Major League Baseball goes through in a, a single game. But yeah, you you got to clean that stuff up. And you, you just it's kind of hard to imagine that they allow it to be like that. Like you figure that yeah. they'd be on top of everything, but I don't know. I, I love the conspiracy theories and I know there's going to be more of this year throughout the entire sport. So I can't wait for that. Oh yeah. I eat them up. I love them. I love hearing them. I love talking about them. They're a lot of fun. Um, okay. So now the blue Jays are going to Yankee stadium. They're playing two against the Yankees and then they're heading, as you mentioned for a tough series against the Tampa Bay Rays. Um, I guess my first question to you is, when do you think this offense is going to get going? Like you, If you put a date on it, you look at the schedule ahead, they're facing the Yankees, they're facing the Rays, and then they're coming back home and facing the Mariners and the Reds before they head out on the road again. When do things start happening? When does this offense wake up? Does it happen in New York? Does it happen in Tampa Bay? Does it happen in Toronto against Seattle, which is not doing well this season? And Cincinnati, which is often one of the worst starts in baseball history. When does this offense wake up? I mean, it's tough because we went into this weekend saying this is a crucial part. I was kind of the front runner on that one or leading that, saying that. And you you predicted a sweep as well. I did predict a sweep. You know, we, we had high hopes for this series. Down. We had high hopes for this series where you saw flashes. It goes back to normal. Maybe that's small progress because we finally saw them cash in a few times. Maybe they're working through breaking this out. Do I want to say they're going to be perfect by New York? I don't think so. Are they going to be kind of back on track by Tampa? A lot's got to go right. Uh, I think, you know, you obviously have a higher chance of it happening in Tampa than you do in New York, but at the end of the day, you got to find ways to win. And, you know, if they've done it this year, finding ways to win in one run games, perhaps there's a couple scenarios this weekend or sorry, this week where they do that, you know, you have Seattle next week, like you said, they haven't been as good as last year. They have kind of been off to a slow start. And then Cincinnati has been an absolute tire fire. So I don't know, because Cleveland was a 500 team. You were expecting them to kind of pitch well. We actually thought the only time they wouldn't hit that well was against Shane Bieber, and it turned out that was the only game where they actually hit the ball well. So maybe they have to face good pitchers. Maybe it's a little bit of a reverse psychology on this one. We know New York's up. You know, New York's got pretty good pitchers. We know that, at least at the front end of the rotation, we know that Tampa picks up players no matter where, you know, from all over the world, it seems like, or all over, I should say, baseball, and they turn them into elite relievers out of the bullpen. So I I don't – I'll say it won't be New York, 
And I want to be optimistic that you see something by next weekend. And then you're going to be carrying into the homestand, but I don't, I don't want to kind of say it's going to happen against the Mariners or the Reds. So I'm going to kind of say, I'll say by next weekend, I think we're going to be a lot better, especially with Teoscar Hernandez back for a full week. Now he's going to get settled back in. I, I like, I like the chances for next weekend. So next weekend being against the Rays, that's when you think it'll get going? Correct. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. I think it'll take a little bit longer. I think they'll get going when they come back home against Seattle. I'll put it there because I think you're right. Like Teoscar Hernandez needs more time to settle into this lineup. And yeah, we've seen flashes of what we know he can do, but – then again, it was one at bat that he got a hit in, and it was a single, even if it did drive in two runs. So um, that's one thing that I think will take time to get going. And then, yeah, there's just a factor of the Yankees have a phenomenal pitching staff that's second best in the majors this year. We know what the Rays do year in and year out, no matter who is pitching for them and where they are playing and where the Blue Jays are facing them. Um, but I think Seattle could present an opportunity um, but then again, maybe it is sort of that reverse psychology that you mentioned. It seems like when you least expect it, that's when the offense gets going. So maybe it will take place at Tropicana Field. Maybe Yankee Stadium is the thing that will turn the Blue Jays offense on his head. Who knows? Um, who knows when that'll happen? Hopefully it is soon. And the next question I have for you before we wrap it up is series predictions. It's a short two game series. So there's not much to predict. The matchups. For the Yankees, they have Luis Severino and Jamison Tyone on the mound. The Blue Jays have Jose Barrios on the mound, and they also have Yusei Kikuchi on the mound. And Kikuchi is coming off the best start of his young Blue Jays career. So it might not be as a, much of a shoe in as you might think, but where are you going on this? I'll be an optimist again this week because you said Kikuchi coming off a really good start. He's got to maintain that. He did not do that last time. Perhaps he writes the story different this time. And then somebody who we didn't even mention throughout the series is that Jose Barrios is another one who struggled in Cleveland this weekend. You got to imagine he's going to be pretty amped up to kind of rebound a little bit. I like it where the two pitchers are this week for the matchup. But the question is the offense because we know that they've been carrying and they've been doing their part. The pitching has. The offense has not. So you face off against, like you said, Luis Severino, who really dominated the Jays last time. And then you have Jameson Tyone, who's done pretty good against the Jays throughout um, this, I guess, his couple starts this year. I think the Jays are going to be a little bit better matched up against Severino, kind of approaching it better. I'll say they, I'll say they win both games. And I think they get them back wow. from what they, they did last weekend. They got to get going at some point, and it's gonna, they got to do it. And this is a team who performs well at Yankee Stadium. Wow. So you aren't burned by predicting a sweep this week and for a massively backfire. Heck no. That's impressive. Heck no. Uh, I think I agree with you about Jose Brios. I think, um, yeah, he'll be looking to bounce back a little bit from Cleveland where he gave up six runs in 4.2 innings. Um, I also think he had a serviceable start his last time out in New York, which is the only time the Blue Jays have been at Yankee Stadium this season. Second start of the season, he was bouncing back from that terrible first outing on opening day. He went five innings, three runs, five strikeouts, three walks. Um, did give up two homers, but pitched around a lot of offense. I think he'll be looking to perform better in New York, and I think he'll be able to bounce back a little bit. So that being said, I'm not as optimistic as you. I think they go one and one. I think they split it. And I think you can be happy with the split. Um, I anticipate both these games being incredibly low scoring, but I will take it if the Blue Jays split it and wait until next week against Seattle to get the offense going. And we did get word from Jacob, who isn't here today, what he thought the final um, outcome of this series would be. And he is a pessimist, and he went 0-2. He thinks the Blue Jays will drop both of these games Something of this Jacob. series. So, I I mean, we got the same thing that we had going last episode, which is all three of us saying a different result. Last week, all of us were wrong. But uh, this, this Jacob, time... I thought Jacob predicted the series loss in Cleveland. I think he said two and two. I think he said... Oh, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. You're right. You said, I said and three I said, and one, and you said a sweep. sweep. Yeah. yeah, so you are right. But this are. time, what one of us is going to be right this time. So... 
I it's like just that. a question of who. <laughs> we'll be looking forward to that. We do have an off day on Monday, which I guess today as we record this at 12.53 a.m. Um, we have the off day going right now. Uh, and then the Blue Jays play Tuesday, Wednesday, after, af- off day off- after that. And then they play Tampa Bay. So we'll be waiting eagerly to see how things turn out in the Bronx. Until then, as always, you can support our podcast by following us on social media. That's at Section 138 Pod on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. You can also give us a rating and review over on Spotify or Apple Podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you listen to our podcast, check out our YouTube. If you watch these episodes on YouTube, check out our podcasters if that's the way you prefer to listen to podcasts. Um, all right. Series in New York. Jose Brios, you say Kikuchi. Uh, I got high hopes, but I don't think they'll work out. Bryson, you have high hopes. You do think they'll work out. Jacob yes. has no hopes at all. We'll see how it goes. We'll catch you then. Peace.